You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you this time about spiritual warfare. When I look back at my own experience and the crises of my own spiritual life, I don't think I can recall a single time when a major decision was not followed by a spiritual struggle. We've been talking about five American missionaries who were just on the verge of trying to make face-to-face -face contact with a group of Stone Age people in the eastern jungle of Ecuador, people called Aucas. Nate felt that it would be wise to have at least four men, and when Pete agreed, then he felt that they should ask yet another one, so that three men could stay on the beach in their camp each night, and Nate and one other man could fly the plane out so that the plane would not be flooded in case the river should come up or the sand become soft or something dangerous like that. So then he began to think about this man, Raj Udarian, the man from Montana, who had showed such zeal in his attempt to reach the Atshwadas, a group of the Hivaro tribe, people who used to shrink human heads, a fearsome tribe that Raj had made contact with. Nate was sure of Roger's capabilities. He saw him as a soldier of Christ, a man capable of great effort, trained and disciplined, as he wrote. He knows the importance of unswerving conformity to the will of his captain. He was a disciplined paratrooper. He gave Uncle Sam his best in that battle, and now he is determined that the Lord Jesus Christ shall not get less than his best. Everything that made him a good soldier has been consecrated to Christ, his new captain. So Ed and Jim, although they hardly knew Roger, working with different Indians in another part of the eastern jungle, had trusted Nate's judgment implicitly. If you think Raj is the man, then we will happily work with Raj, was their decision. And it just happened that Raj was in Shalmeta at the time. He had come out from his station, Makuma, to help build a mission-sponsored hospital, and one day, while he was nailing down sheets of aluminum, Nate came to him, told him about this top-secret operation called Operation Alka, and asked if he would be willing to go along as the fifth man. Would Raj go? Raj agreed immediately. And then, as so often happens, when we've made a major decision that involves spiritual things, it was followed by spiritual struggles. When I look back at my own experience and the crises of my own spiritual life, I don't think I can recall a single time when a major decision was not followed by a spiritual struggle. Satan cannot bear for any of us to do the will of God. That is one thing he cannot stand. And as soon as he sees that a man or a woman has made up his mind to believe God and to obey God and to step out and act, he immediately swings into action. Raj began to feel terribly discouraged. Was he accomplishing anything among the Atshwadas? If not, how could he even think of going to another tribe? Who did he think he was? Was there any fruit? In the first year or two, he was learning the language, thinking to himself, the fruit will come later. He had learned the language now. Where was the fruit? And what about all that romance that the prospective missionary imagines? The exotic places, the strange customs, the people sitting around waiting for somebody to come and bring them the gospel, the eager, hungry hands reaching up, the empty faces, the lack of joy. You get there, you find out that nobody's waiting for you, nobody's lifting up empty hands, and lack of joy, well, my experience with Indians was that they were among the happiest people I've ever known, seemingly. They laugh a lot, they play, they're peaceful, serene, very easy to get along with people, easy to love. Romance, well, it dissipates very quickly, and there wasn't any left for Raj. It was just plodding, plodding, plodding. 
The days were the same, it seemed, sharpening the tools, hauling water, cutting wood, trying to make a generator go, giving shots, delivering babies, doing a whole lot of things that really didn't seem to have very much to do with what he thought he had gone there to do. No crises, no mass conversions, not even one or two to whom he could point and say, there is a transformed life. Oh, there were professions. There were people who said, yes, I believe. Yes, I'll take the gospel. Yes, I'm a sinner. I know I need a savior. And they'd come to church. They might listen to the readings of the Bible. They might even pray. But Raj was looking for real fruit, that radical distinction between the believer and the non-believer. The one who, at great cost, perhaps, to himself, leaves the godless culture in which he's grown up and takes that hard and costly step of public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. What kind of a difference does it make in your life that you belong to him? Would your neighbor be able to watch your life and know that there was a difference? That's what Raj was hoping for, and that's what Raj was not seeing. He watched, he longed, and his heart began to sicken. There's a passage in Scripture that explains what was going on here. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it says, Put on all the armor which God provides, so that you may be able to stand firm against the devices of the devil. For our fight is not against human foes, but against cosmic powers, against the authorities and potentates of this dark world, against superhuman forces of evil in the heavens. Do you believe in superhuman forces of evil in the heavens? Do you think there's such a thing as a personal devil? Well, number one, I believe what the Bible says. And number two, my experience corroborates exactly that. Because my experiences with evil have been personal experiences. And so I believe in a personal devil. And the Apostle Paul goes on in this passage to say, Take up, therefore, God's armor. Then you will be able to stand your ground when things are at their worst, to complete every task and still to stand. Stand firm, I say. The superhuman forces of evil, these dark cosmic powers, were fighting against Roger Udarian. I don't have any doubt about that. It wasn't merely the fact that the missionary romance was over with. In Roger's diary, this is what he wrote, I'm about ready to call it quits. The reason? Failure to measure up as a missionary and get next to the people. As far as my heart and aspirations are concerned, the issue is settled. It's a bit difficult to discern just what is the cause of my failure and the forces behind it. Since March, when we left Wambimi, there has been no message from the Lord for us. I just picked up my Bible to share with the same Lord who made me a new creature in England 11 years ago. There was no word of encouragement from him. He had kept us safe wonderfully and met our needs, but the issue is far greater than that. There is no ministry for me among the Hiveros or the Spanish, and I'm not going to try to fool myself. I wouldn't support a missionary such as I know myself to be, and I'm not going to ask anyone else to do that. Three years is long enough to learn a lesson and learn it well. Some people are slow to catch on. It'll be tough on Barb and the children, but I've always been convinced that honesty and sincerity pays. The milk is spilled. I'm not going to cry over it. The cause of Christ and the Hivaria will not suffer for our having been there, but I must be honest and confess that it has not been helped. I don't think it will come as much of a surprise to many and will only be an I told you so. There is no spiritual pressure in the issue, and in fact, very little of emotion or stress, perhaps none. That was the effect of this spiritual attack. Then, later on, it seemed that he was cleansed through the Spirit 
for the task which lay ahead. Barbara was, had been praying, and she saw the answer to her prayer. She said when the invitation came to go to the Alcas, Raj went with a happy, expectant mind and heart, full of joy. He was cleansed through the Spirit for the task that lay ahead of him. On December 19th, he wrote in his diary, I will die to self. I will begin to ask God to put me in a service of constant circumstances where to live Christ, I must die to self. I will be alive unto God, that I may learn to love him with my heart, mind, soul, and body. Just before he left Makuma to join the four in Arahuno, he wrote, There is a seeking of honest love drawn from a storm-tossed soul, a seeking for the gain of Christ, to bless the blinded, the beaten, the lost. Those who sought found heavenly love and were filled with joy divine. They walk today with Christ above. And then the last line eluded him, and as he put down his pencil, he said, Barb, I'll finish it when I get home. What is your personal Waterloo? Have you made a decision which immediately has been attacked and you've been convinced that you had made a mistake? You've done something terrible, something that you should never have done. It's going to damage your family, your life. Go back to God's leading in the making of that decision. Realize that if it was in fact his leading, you must not dig up in doubt what you planted in faith. That was the Gateway to Joy broadcast called Spiritual Warfare, originally aired in 1989. 